Welcome to everybody to uh, the first, uh, if we uh, don't count uh, uh, Paola Caselli's seminar, outreach seminar she gave in uh, Follonica. This is uh, the very first seminar, uh, star seminar. Uh, so the very first uh, seminar of um, um, in the frame of uh, our uh, new uh, interuniversitary center, STAR. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker uh, of this uh, seminar, Jens Juve Grabov. Let me give just uh, a few notes uh, about him. So he uh, took the uh, diploma in chemistry in uh, uh, 1989. Uh, then uh, he got his uh, PhD uh, in 1993, both of them at the University uh, uh, of Kiel. And then uh, in 2004, uh, he got the Venia Legendi uh, at the um, Leibniz University uh, of um, Hanover. And in the same university, uh, since 2010, he, um, he is a professor uh, there. Uh, there are uh, many honors to be listed. Just let me... Uh, um, tell you uh, a few of them. So uh, it was a Smithsonian visiting science, uh, so it was award uh, with the Smithsonian visiting science uh, position uh, at the Smithsonian Institute of Washington DC in 1996. Uh, he got the uh, International Math Stark Prize in 2009. And uh, he gave the Norma, uh, Norman Esco Lecture on the Frontiers of Science in spring 2010 at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he gave the Morino Lecture uh, in uh, uh, 2015 in Japan at the Morino Foundation for Molecular uh, Science. He was Howard of the uh, ICRAS. Um, uh, 2000, uh, across award in uh, 2016. Uh, this is the uh, India uh, Spectrophysics Association. And uh, uh, this year was uh, a visiting fellow at the um, Instituto di Studi Avanzati of the University of Bologna. Uh, his research areas cover physical chemistry, molecular physics, high resolution spectroscopy, optical technology, spectroscopic application, and sensor science. So it's my pleasure to in, give uh, uh, the, um, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to say in English. <laughs> Anyway, it's your turn, and I was looking for the title of the seminar, but uh, it's missing. Okay, so dual excitation emission propagation, deep impact uh, Fourier transform microwave spectrometer, and monolithic cobra Fourier transform microwave spectrometers. Please. Yeah, thank you, Christina, for this, this nice introduction. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. This is my, f my first time, not only at this institution, at the Scuola Normale, but also in TISA, so I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, the, only, the only bad thing that happened so far is when I tried to make a picture with my iPhone of the, of the tower, it straightened out the lines so it looked just like a straight tower. So, <laughs> anyway, so I'm, I'm here, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm a microwave spectroscopist, and what I, what I want to do today here is to raise a little bit of interest into microwave spectroscopy and, and especially uh, uh, how, to, how to perform microwave spectroscopy instrument-wise. So I, I did a number of molecules, obviously, in my, my life, but uh, uh, what I'm mainly doing, or my... my my, my, I have the most interest in is, is developing spectrometers uh, into several directions and make them make them better in sensitivity or resolution, uh, or also uh, the application to to systems. So, 
For those of you who are not microwave spectroscopists or, or are only familiar with uh, absorption spectroscopy, uh, what we are doing is coherence type of spectroscopy, which means we don't just do absorption, we don't have just a source and then uh, a line of sight through our molecules and detect on the other side and we change the source, the frequency of the source and detect absorption or do this with the with the, uh, with the, with the Michelson interferometer. What we do is we have a gas sample in a jet or free space, then we apply a short pulse just like in NMR spectroscopy and create as a result of the short pulse coherence. So we, we introduce a phase condition on these molecules. In our case, it's, it's rotational spectroscopy, though these then just don't rotate randomly anymore. The molecules uh, are aligned. And as a result, we get a macroscopic oscillating dipole moment uh, that then gives rise to, a, to an uh, electric field, an oscillating electric field uh, that you can calculate using Maxwell equation. And then with an antenna, we can just pick up this, this macroscopic electric field, uh, fully transform it, and then get, get our, this, I have problems with this. I hope it's not because I'm drunk after Lorenzo gave me a glass of wine at lunch. <laughs> so, and, and as a result, we get our spectrum, which of course has the same frequencies as, as we would get in an in a absorption type of spectrometer, except uh, it, if we do it right, it's more sensitive. If we get better resolution, uh, we are background free uh, because no source is on at the, at the moment when we detect our, our, our lines. So. Uh, because we are in the microwave, uh, which is a, a low part in the, in the frequency region, we have very little problems with Doppler broadening. Uh, also, because the energy of the states is quite low, the, the, the lifetime of our states is quite long. Uh, basically years, if you, if you take into account fluctuations of a background field, it's still like weeks or months that our, sta our states would live unless they collide or something else happens. So we get very, very narrow lines. So even in the case of very, very dense spectra that we get for kind of heavy molecules like enfluorane in this example, which, which is an anesthetic, uh, we can zoom into these spectra and see even more lines and zoom in even more. And in the end, uh, in most of the cases, we don't have blending and we can assign a quantum number or a set of quantum numbers to each individual signal rather than having like a band of, of, uh, of overlapping lines. So we are very, very, we are very, very precise and this is, this is a big advantage of my fixed spectroscopy that we can then very, very precisely uh, determine molecular parameters if, if we get the spectrum. To be sensitive, nowadays most people use the Fabio type resonator and introducing all the molecules with a supersonic jet, this is very, very sensitive because of the, the uh, supersonic expansion. We populate low energy states very efficiently, so these become then very intense. Because of the supersonic expansion, we also get a uh, velocity equilibration, which in addition to the low frequency we're operating at, gives very, very narrow lines. So it gives basically unrivaled resolution uh, in the spectrum we have. But the problem is, because of the high Q resonator, we are very narrow banded, so we need to know where the lines are or we have to search for a long time normally, uh, at least how it was done classically. Then some years ago, first by, uh, introduced by Brooks Pate, uh, we tried to make a more broadband excitation. Uh, so instead of looking at a very narrow frequency region of a few megahertz or one megahertz, we can now look at, at gigahertz or even more than gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, uh, using a chirp, a pulse that is swept in frequency rather than a fixed frequency pulse. Uh, the disadvantage of this technique is we don't have a resonator because this is bandwidth limiting that uh, then takes away some of our, our sensitivity that we have in the, in the classical uh, Fabio Pro type, type spectrometer. So this is, uh, but, but we try to overcome this and I'll show you what, what we did and what we tried to do. Uh, first thing is, uh, we tr I try to make a rather compact instrument 
Also, uh, with the idea that I don't only want to build a very special instrument in my own lab, but also uh, be able to disseminate this method to other labs uh, and find a way that uh, with very smallest number of components and also many components from just one vendor, so you can pe tell people what to buy and, and more easily build uh, an instrument in other labs, plus also you have to write the software to, to run this instrument. So uh, what also helps is to have some, some uh, standard way of setting up such a spectrometer so you don't have to rewrite a lot of the program again. So this is, this is our approach, or my approach, uh, using mostly national instrument hardware in a national instrument PXI rack uh, with a lot of components of national instrument plus, this is a silver, uh, these silver panels here plus some additional components that we develop ourselves and hand over and, and give away to, to people that like it to build such a spectrometer. This was, this was the first example of this broad, more broadband type spectrometer that, that we built, which is the alkaloid nicotine. You see here one gigahertz scan. This was one measurement uh, measured in a few seconds and now, now only see the it used to work better before. Anyway, I think as you can it sees this what you see here lines of two conformers of, of the alkaloid nicotine that have been have been measured in a in a in a few seconds and then analyzed and, and then in a normal way uh, as I will show you later we get the rotational constant of, of these two conformers uh, and assign the, the, uh, the absolute configuration if we also have uh, an uh, excess isotopic species. This was it's kind of historic because it was the really first molecule measured this way. If you, if you look at this, this spectrometer, maybe I should stay here. Uh, without going into detail of all the parts, you have basically color coded in blue here radio frequency part, then in green a microwave excitation part, and then in uh, this brown orange color, we have the detection part of the spectrometer where we pick up the emission signal of the molecules, then down convert them again in the radio frequency range to, uh, to then uh, digitize the signal, Fourier transform it, and get our spectrum. In the first approach, we still had here two horns. As you see here, with, with jet nozzles pulsing across these horns. Uh, using these horns, of course, it's necessary, instead of using a resonator, to not have a, the bandwidth limitation of the resonator. Uh, but the disadvantage of doing it this way is you have a very short interaction time of the molecules coming out of the jet in between these horns, in the active region between the horns, so you get broad signals again. So you lose some of the advantage that, that we got used to in the microwave by going the broadband way, because now your lines are getting an order of magnitude broader again. So, uh, so you lose use a lot of the, the accuracy that microwave is known for. And one of the goals was, for us at least, to, to overcome this and bring back the method to, to the microwave accuracy we're used to. And this, this was our approach. Instead of using uh, two horn antennas, uh, we are used this, these parabolic reflectors. Uh, in, uh, in, in blue here. And what this does is we're trying to create an environment for a supersonic jet expansion that is very similar to the coaxial expansion of a supersonic jet in our resonator. So what we want to do is to have the long interaction time that we have for the jet in the resonator and also the observation time of the emission of the jet in the resonator without having a resonator that gives us a benefits limitation. And what we do here is we use this, these two parabolic Reflectors, They're basically the same reflectors you know you have f from, a, from a TV dish. Uh, because they are parabolic reflectors rather than spherical mirrors, they do not, they, they, they reflect, but they do not form a resonator. 
So you don't have the bandwidth limitation of the resonator. What we do here is we have our horn, which we use to introduce our microwave pulse. On the other side here, which would be just a parabolic reflector horn antenna, TV dish antenna as this one, but here we removed the horn and replaced it by a aluminum plate, by a flat aluminum plate, and in the center of the aluminum plate, we placed our uh, supersonic jet expansion nozzle. And what this does is, uh, the supersonic jet exiting here is kind of actually uh, expanding around the, um, the microwave field as in the, in the, in the resonator. So, uh, I have to go back here to show this animation. We apply the microwave pulse. This is somehow not working. It didn't work before. I try it again. We first introduce the gas pulse. Then the microwave pulse is applied, creates a coherence inside in, in our molecular sample. Uh, and then the molecules radiate themselves, which is shown here and the molecular signal is picked up again and we do the Fourier transform of the time domain signal to, to get our spectrum. Uh, maybe I should go here, not even try to use this pointer function. function. So we get the highest electric field at, at the point where we have the, the highest molecular density, so that helps us doing this with a relatively moderate microwave amplifier because one of the disadvantages of not having a resonator is if you have a resonator like in the fabric prototype spectrometer, you of course get a very, very much enhanced electric field that polarizes the molecules. If you want to be broad and you don't have a resonator, then the field is much, much smaller. But with this arrangement where the two parabolic reflectors focus the field on the molecular jet, you gain something back. So you can, you still need a somewhat higher power amplifier, but not, not like a crazy uh, uh, amplifier that you would normally use with just two horn antennas. So this is, this is one example. You get here broadband spectrum, uh, one gigahertz and one, one experiment. And the advantage of this broadband spectroma, uh, spectroscopy is not only that you cover a larger frequency region in a shorter time, but also Immediately when you, when you get your, your experimental spectrum, like this one here, you can, you can compare it to a synthesized spectrum from a quantum chemical prediction. And typically, since a lot of spectroscopy is pattern recognition, you, you recognize which pattern belong together of your, your prediction and your, your uh, ex experiment, and you can, uh, can do the assignment and then the spectral fitting much, much faster fashion than it's possible with a narrow band uh, cobra type spectrometer where you see a line and first, because you don't see a pattern, don't know which, which is this line if, if your quantum chemical prediction isn't very good. If your quantum, quantum chemical prediction is kind of good already, then you, uh, it's, it's much easier uh, because you expect something, a, a signal close to your prediction, but if you have uh, molecules that have large amplitude motions or huge quadruple coupling constants, which, which are much less under control than just a normal rigid molecule, uh, you, you, you are much faster in assigning a spectrum. Plus, uh, what you also see here on the, on the right side, you get a Doppler doublet, the Doppler doublet that were used already from the Cobra type, Fabio Rho type resonator. Now again, this setup is a two parabolic reflectors. You get a signal that is very similar to, to the signal you get uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a cobra type spectrometer because now, now your lines uh, are, are very narrow again. Okay. This uh, is, in this case, the first example uh, after implementing this parabolic reflectors which is not a very nice spectrum, but what you see here, epsilon caprolaptam, this is the, the, historically the very first example, the very first molecule we measured 
with a nitrogen nucleus in the molecule, which me and uh, what you see here is the quadruple hyperfine structure, which is not very nice, but at least you see it, the quadruple hyperfine structure of the nitrogen nucleus in, the, in, the, in all other broadband chip pulse spectrometers. You would see nothing of this because it would be all buried in, in the line width. So now again, we're coming back to a situation where with a single measurement, also in the broadband fashion, uh, you see all these narrow features, uh, whereas uh, for many broadband spectrometers that exist now, people then have to, after measuring or finding the lines, have to go back to a, to a resonator type spectrometer, measure at higher resolution to see these features. So here, in many cases, you don't need to go back because you already see the splitting in the broadband spectrum. Then the next thing is, uh, if we go back here, what you see here is uh, you need you need a switch here that can be switched back and forth between excitation and detection of your spectrum. Uh, so you introduce a microwave pulse, then you polarize your molecules, and then you have to use have to use this switch to switch to the detection part of the spectrometer to record the spectrum. This is bad for, for a number of reasons. First of all, this switch introduces an insertion loss, so you're not as sensitive as you could be. Plus, also these switches, which are semiconductors, uh, don't sustain a lot of power. So even if you would have a large amplifier here to polarize your molecules efficiently, you couldn't use it because you would destroy this switch. So this you really don't want the switch at this position. So what we then do is we replace this antenna here and replace it with another antenna that has actually, instead of one in and output, two in and outputs. Normally these, uh, these antennas, which you see here, they look very funny, are used to create a circular polarized field. So we misuse these antennas and use one input output for polarization and the other in and output, which was normally the, the Q input, 90 degree phase input for the output of, our, of, our, uh, that, uh, of the emission that is created by our molecules. And the advantage of this is you now don't need, you now don't need this, these switches anymore. Uh, because you don't need to switch back and forth between excitation and emission because you already have two channels. And that way you don't have the insertion loss of this switch and also during polarization, it would also steal some power from your polarization pulse. You also have more power available for your polarization. Uh, the, the, uh, what you have to do in order uh, is though, because the polarization detection of the input and the output differs by 90 degree, and if you would maintain the polarization of, of your excitation, which normally happens, you would see nothing because the other output of the antenna is just in the perpendicular plane, and no signal would, would uh, arrive at that point. So we need to rotate the polarization of our molecular emission by 90 degree, uh, to see signal there, and that microwavers know this. To, in order to do so, is you you use a, you use a rooftop reflector, and this rooftop reflector either acts on the incoming microwave pulse that polarizes the molecules, or it it acts on reflected uh, on, the, on the on the microwave signal of our excited molecules that is reflected by this rooftop. So it works on the blue and the red shift part of the Doppler doublet that, before, that we saw before. So we again get a Doppler doublet uh, just like in a, in a fabric pro type resonator spectrometer where the real molecular signal is the, uh, the mean of, of our molecular emission. Then the next thing to do is to optimize your signal. And to optimize your signal, uh, you have to look a little bit into the theory of this excitation experiment. Uh, what, what you uh, 
see here is the block vector representation of, of the experiment. You see here this red omega vector. What happens is during excitation, you create population difference. Population difference is here the value along the w axis. Uh, and if you, you convert this population difference into coherence, which is in the uv axis. And if you make a pulse of the right power and the right length, you convert all of the population difference into coherence. So you rotate this blue vector by 90 degree. That's why it's called 90 degree pulse or pi over 2 pulse. And if, if your pulse is too long or too powerful, uh, you, ra you, ro you rotate not in the UV plane, you rotate further, and then your molecular emission becomes smaller again because your coherence is smaller. And that's what we see here uh, for two different transitions of 111 tetrafluoroethane. If you have the right pi over 2 pulse lengths, uh, you get a signal maximum. If you make it longer or the pulse stronger, your signal decreases again. If you have another transition, which is in this case a mu A type, which has a smaller dipole moment component. Uh, then the, the mu B type, which is in blue here, you need a longer pulse or at the same pulse length, uh, large excitation power to, to see this maximum, which is good for one, one line. But in the broadband spectrum, of course, you, don't, you can't optimize on one line. You, for example, optimize uh, on a whole, whole pattern here, which is a, it's, is a Q branch. So you have a number of transitions that you all have to uh, to polarize, uh, which is depicted here for the chirp pulse experiments. So instead of having a fixed frequency pulse, you here have a chirp, which means this red vector is now swept from being aligned to the to the omega to the w axis through the UV plane to the opposite alignment to the w axis, and as a result, you. Uh, you polarize instead of one line, a whole set of lines. The goal is again to end up in the plane with the, wrong, with the correct pulse length times uh, excitation uh, field. And, and that's exactly what you, what you can do uh, with the chip pulse experiment, getting the same polarization as, as in the fab row type experiment. So, uh, and we optimize this with this dual polarization horn antenna, the, quadrature horn antenna, and the first example we did here is the spectrum of cycloheptane carbamide. Uh, the cycloheptane carbamide uh, is a very flexible ring. It can exist in a number of conformers. Uh, seven of them are non-equivalent. Some are just mirror images or, or, or identical. Uh, the mirror images in uh, nonsomeres have the same rotational spectrum, so we can't distinguish them in this kind of experiment. And then you can make the broadband experiment, as we see here, which gives a very, very dense spectrum. Uh, uh, nevertheless, because of the, of the very narrow line widths we have, we can assign all the lines. Uh, and the conformer, conformers uh, that are in our sample simultaneously and, and, and fit them and determine the structure. So. Uh, that also has hyperfine structure, has a, has a large amplitude motion, and has a, has a, a nitrogen a nucleus. And this is a broadband spectrum as you see it, but you can zoom into the spectrum, and without having to go back to the Fabi-Pro type resonator experiment, you you can determine the the, the, the hyperfine structure directly from the broadband spectrum. Uh, another example is the 2-cyanopyridin, which actually is a molecule with two nitrogens. And even in this case, in the Broadband experiment, you can resolve the, the quadruple hyperfine structure of a molecule with two nitrogens present at, at the same time. Whereas in a normal Broadband spectrometer with just two horns, you would just see one broad feature and would have to do the experiment again, measure every line again. Uh, instead of uh, having it all here already. So this is, again, a representation of this type of spectrometer. And what I want to show here is uh, in, this, in this blue 
dashed line box is basically the main concept of the spectrometer. I call it impact scheme, which is basically uh, an IQ polarization, uh, IQ uh, down conversion scheme of your molecular signal. Uh, and the, the main part of this are these two IQ modulators and demodulators. Whereas in the old impact scheme, in the old Fabio row type resonator scheme, you just had simple single sideband mixers that were just limited to one sideband frequency. Here you have these IQ modulators, which then allow you to do a chirp. And what we then did is to also basically go back to the to the Fabio Pro type resonator machine and also use these kind of mixers instead of using single sideband mixers. This uh, looks like this. And this, so we now basically built the Fabio Pro type resonator machines uh, using also this, this impact IQ scheme. So basically the part that is here in the dashed blue line box. And I'll show you which kind of advantages it had. First, but before I do so, I uh, show you what we have here in the, in the solid line blue box, which is basically this, uh, uh, not counting the smaller micro components here, the expensive part of, of the spectrometer with all the, the expensive electronics uh, detection and, and, and creating uh, the, the excitation signals. And if you look at this, is basically Everything in the solid blue box here are cards that are inside a PXI chassis with components that you basically all can buy from national instruments and they provide almost everything you need to build a Fourier transform microwave spectrometer except they don't probably know it, that, that they basically sell a Fourier transform microwave spectrometer. In principle, they could send, put, equip the whole box like this and sell it as a Fourier transform microwave spectrometer well, not quite, because you need a few like switches here. But the basic electronics and the functionality of the spectrometer you can go get from them. And this is how it looks as a PXI chassis. You buy all these cards, put them in, and, and, and then you just need a few cables and, and, and some uh, analog signal processing components, switches, and, and, and low noise amplifiers. Well, still a lot. Especially what you then need is a vacuum chamber and a pump. And, and antennas and mirrors. But the, all the electronics almost you can get from National Instruments uh, and it's basically very easy to build one now because you don't have to look at 20 different vendors, buy components, then write a computer program, then hope that all these drivers work together and don't interfere. So this is all very nice because you can use all the drivers, they all work together and, and it just works. So this is how it looks like in reality. Uh, with the cards. There's still a lot of cables uh, that you have to connect. Uh, the cables we do not buy from National Instrument, uh, but, but it's basically an all-in-one box setup with some stuff around it. So, and coming back to this here, uh, in, the, in the red box uh, are the uh, IQ modulator, IQ demodulator, rather than the single sideband mixers, you would have a traditional free transfer microwave spectrometer. And the advantage of using these IQ modulators rather than single sideband mixers uh, or, uh, or image rejection mixers is the following. This is how these devices look like. You can buy them from MyTech or other vendors. You can, you can use this setup not only uh, and connecting them to the arbitrary waveform generator that is used in the chirp spectrometers, but also here. And you can use this setup to either use a chirp to build a, a broadband chirp spectrometer, or you can use it to create a pulsed sideband, which you would use to make a traditional Fourier transform Fabio Rho type spectrometer. And also, instead of having to buy a more expensive microwave Sweeper, you can just buy a microwave fixed frequency CW generator, which is available as a national instrument cards. And instead of having this swept tuning capability that we would need to, to tune your resonator in, built in in a very expensive microwave synthesizer, 
you can you can use the arbitrary waveform generator. You have any you have any way together with the IQ modulator to to sweep over your mode, and uh, you have everything you need to build a Fabio Brotap resonator in addition to building a chip spectrometer. So. Uh, this is how it looks like, or the first spectrometer that was built this way, which is the one that is since about one and a half years in operation at Chongqing University in China. Uh, so, where's the mouse again? You have here the resonator chamber. Here the diffusion pump is housed. Uh, on the on the back side, it has a tube going in and out, so you can get rid of the of the of the heat that is generated by the diffusion pump uh, instead of heating up the whole room. Uh, and it's besides besides the the National Instrument PXI box you have here, the only bigger box you have is is the IOTA one. Uh, pulse controller for the, for, the, for the electromagnetic pulse valve, and then there are just some power supplies and the computer, that's it. Okay, the first molecule we measured here is, was 1112 tetrafluoroethane, which is this dimer here to the left. It can, in principle, exist in a number of configurations that have been calculated or predicted quantum chemically at, at different energies, of course. Uh, so we then, in a usual way, predict the rotational constant of the different conformation that are anticipated and, and compare uh, the uh, experimental rotational constant after the spectrum is assigned with the rotational constant of the prediction. What we see here is two predicted conformations are rather similar in the rotational constants. So it's difficult to decide if you have conformer one or conformer two. But that's not the only information we have, the rotation constant, but also the line strengths of the different transitions, A, B, and C type. And if you, if you see here the experimental spectrum, the, only the A type spectrum was strong, B and C type was weak. And for the quantum chemical prediction, this is true for conformer B, but not for conformer 1. Of course, you still not necessarily absolute certain. What we then normally also can do is measure the, the C13 isotopic species, which we see in, in, isotopic, uh, in, in natural abundance. Then do the RS structure and compare the structure with the, the up initial predicted structure. And here also the experimental structure is in closer agreement with the up initial structure of, of conformer 2, even though, of course, is uh, here we compare the equilibrium structure with the RS or zero structure, which is not the nicest way of doing this, but already also this is consistent with the assignment using the, the intensity of the mu A, B, and C spectrum. And uh, in fact, we only found one conformer. Here's one broadband spectrum again, which is, which is this one, which has a hydrogen bond network of, of four interactions with, with these bond distances. Okay. One other nice advantage of building uh, a Fourier transform microfix spectrometer using IQ modulators and demodulators rather than, than simple mixers is you can easily, because you can change the sideband frequency here, uh, which is a necessity to do so, you can easily extend this spectrometer later on to different frequency regions. So what you see here outside this dashed box is the fundamental band of the spectrometer, which is typically from 2 to 20 gigahertz, 2 to 26 gigahertz, with normal sized resonator. But at any later time, you can, you can buy some additional components, very easily put them into the spectrometer. And then depending on which set of components you buy, or maybe if you're rich, you can buy all of them. You can extend it to 20 to 40, or 40 to 60, or 60 to 80. Uh, there's a tendency of the components to get more expensive when you go high end frequency. Yes. What? Uh, 
Maybe, maybe I did a mistake because I just did the slide an hour ago. Uh, but you're right. You wouldn't, you, this just ignore line number three. You, you, uh, you, would do, you would do 20 to 40 and then you would just use n equals four, which is then uh, uh, 40 to 80. Sorry, my mistake. Okay, so that can be easily implemented at any later stage, uh, and basically you don't need to build a new spectrometer. All the expensive components here, basically, you reuse, you just introduce here a multiplier with an amplifier that works in that frequency region, and then you, work, you buy, which is a power amplifier, then here you buy a low noise detection amplifier that works in that frequency region, and then you make a pre-down conversion here to get back into your original frequency band and then you, you again use the, the detection system that you already have in your fundamental band. So that, that way you become very, very flexible. Uh, that I'm, I made dots here for, uh, for future extensions, but what, what, really, what really happens is at some point Coaxial components are not available anymore. Basically, this ends now, probably maybe in the somewhere else in the future, where, 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 where the availability of the components stops. You can get coaxial components up to 60 gigahertz more or less standard now. Some will get up to 80. The standards are defined up to 110, and then at 110, there's nothing available anymore. In uh, using coaxial components, so. But up to 80, it is not so difficult to find vendors for the for the components if you need them. Okay, then the other thing is, of course, you have the spectrometer. You can have the broadband spectrometer. You can have the narrowband spectrometer. Uh, what you're then interested in is what kind of systems can I can I detect. And first of all, you need to bring your molecule into gas phase. The molecules have been traditionally or first measured, of course, are molecules, smaller molecules that are already in the gas phase or have a, have a vapor pressure at room temperature that allows you to make a gas mixture with a carrier gas, which is typically 99% a rare gas. You have a concentration high enough at a given dipole moment of the molecule that enables them enables you to detect the spectrum. But then, of course, uh, people also get more interested in more exotic molecules, for example, unstable molecules that are maybe in combustion processes or the molecules that you find in the interstellar medium at, at, at harsh conditions, or larger molecules, biomolecules, uh, or other larger molecules that just don't have the, the vapor pressure you want, sugars, amino acids, whatever. and so uh, one of the major part of the spectrometer is not the spectrometer itself, but the source you combine the spectrometer with. And besides the normal nozzle, you can use the DC discharge nozzle, as you show here, as we sh uh, it's depicted here. You have two electrodes at the, at the throat of the nozzle. You apply a high voltage there. You can either apply a CW voltage or pulsed voltage. Then you have a gas mixture here on the other side of your pulsed valve, either a single gas or either also a gas mixture of different components that then might react. And when you open this valve, you get a DC discharge. You disintegrate a part of your molecules. You get radicals, ions, whatever. It's kind of black magic. Then you can make, you can make this nozzle throat short or you can make it long. Then the fragments you get have more or less time to react. You get smaller or larger molecules. So you, you, can, you can use this method to create a number of instable molecules, larger or smaller, which has very successfully been, been used in, uh, uh, for example, in, in Thaddeus group for, uh, for astrophysical, astrophysically interesting molecules, in this case, long carbon chain type molecules. 
Another thing you can do is if it's just larger molecules, you can use a heated nozzle. Uh, for a number of molecules, this is, works fine. You just heat it up, the vapor pressure increases. If the molecule is not too unstable, so it doesn't pyrolyze or disintegrate at high temperature, you can successfully bring more molecules into the jet, which enables you then to, to, to measure these molecules. Uh, for example, this is coenulene, uh, a large uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, also of astrophysical interest. Uh, I also don't want to talk about this here today, but you can do this. And another thing is laser ablation, either a single laser ablation or dual laser ablation. You can use this to bring molecules in the gas phase that you can't easily heat because they polymerize or they decompose or or maybe get rid of water if, if the molecule gets, can get easily be dehydrated. Heating is not a very best method. But if you, if you apply a short laser pulse, you have, in many, many cases, a better chance to bring the molecule in one piece into the gas phase. That has worked for a number of systems, especially biomolecules, sugars, uh, peptides, amino acids. Or you can bring it to gas phase inorganic material, for example, Salts. So in this case, what we did here is we, we ablated uh, lead, metal, and at the same time we had SF6 here in the gas. In this, in this laser ablation plasma, also the SF6 disintegrated fluorine atoms were, act, were reacting with the lead, and we, we created, uh, in this case, lead fluoride, which we then uh, did the spectroscopy of, and this was an interesting molecule because it's a radical and it has some uh, relativistic effects that are needed, uh, for example, to, to figure out or if the, if the electron is a structureless point charge or if it actually has an electric dipole moment, so it's kind of like a fundamental physics problem. We are still several orders of magnitude away from, from a real measurement, but it's, it's one, of, one of the things that are people interested in. And microwave spectroscopy, if you, if you improve it to the extreme, and you, I, I calculated, you can come close. Uh, of course, nobody knows what the electron the dipole moment is, if it exists. So if there will ever be a, a positive result, that's a different question. Uh, but, but you can use this in addition to look at biomolecules and other stuff. Uh, so that's another, another possibility. What we did recently is flame spectroscopy. So uh, we tried to combine the microwave spectrometer not with one of the traditional pulse sources, but with a flame. Uh, flame spectroscopy or combustion is interesting for these combustion people. Uh, what, what kind of products you have in the combustion. Uh, and microwave spectroscopy can answer a lot of questions that these people currently uh, have difficulties answering because what's typically used is uh, molecular beam mass spectrometry. They are, they are very sensitive, of course, more sensitive than we are. Uh, but if you do mass spectrometry, you don't know about the structure. You measure mass, but if you have little, even at smaller fragments, they can occur at different conformation or different structural isomers, and they are, they are blind to the, to the structure of the mass they measure. And, and for many combustion processes, there are species predicted that have the same mass, but different structures, and this, of course, microwave can easily do. If you have a different structure, you have different moments of inertia, they have different spectra. So the only thing you have to do is, the only thing you have to do is to, to make a microwave spectroscopy work together with a flame, and that's, that's not so easy. Uh, the advantages are, are, are good. Uh, typically, you can even do with a narrow band spectrometer because if you're, if you're interested in the analytics, you already know where the lines are. So the species in principle are known, so you don't need to search. You don't need a broadband spectrometer. You can use a very, very sensitive narrow band spectrometer. The only disadvantage is if if you have species that are, have high symmetry, so they don't have a dipole moment, it doesn't work because the dipole moment we do need, actually. So the, the problem to, to, uh, 
for, the, for this type of spectroscopy is the way these burners work, what these combustion people use, which are so -called, mostly so-called McKenna-type burner, and they work at quite low, low uh, pressure. And the, the, the bad part for us is if you, if you start at very low pressure, it's difficult to get a supersonic expansion. So you get a very, very hot product at, at, uh, at, at low pressure, and there just the sensitivity of, of microwave spectroscopy is not, it's not good enough to, to get a signal. So, but we, we try to overcome this. This is how these, how these burners look like. We, we sample in, in this typically glass cone, and then after sampling in the, in the flame, we can change the distance between the burner and, and this, this skimmer. We quickly pressure it up with the rare gas and then do the supersonic expansion and then see what we get. And, and this uh, pressuring it up with the gas pulse is what enables us, again, to get a supersonic expansion even though the pressure here is low. But the, the pressure of our argon doesn't go back into this capillary, so it, it kind of works. What we did uh, was a little bit uh, inspired by an emilson gutowski nozzle, which is a so-called so fast-mixing nozzle. Looks a little bit different here, but it's, it's the same principle that you have one gas at low pressure and another gas at high pressure, and then co-expand them together to get a supersonic expansion. So this is what we did very quick and dirty. We used our laser ablation nozzle. Instead of having our metal rod and laser ablation nozzle, we put this uh, Teflon tube in here, which was connected to our skimmer. Uh, it doesn't work very well yet because this tube is way too long, but we, we still haven't uh, got the money yet to build a much, much nicer source with very, very short uh, uh, tubes. At the moment, as you see uh, in, the, in the coming upcoming slides, this, this Teflon tube is just way too long, or way too uh, the, the the pass length from the burner to the nozzle is too long to really see instable intermediate species. Uh, so what we did so far is see if it works at all, and if it gives us uh, what the analytical people are interested in, the correct answer in intensities and, and concentration. So. Here, here we see signals that we observe in the flame source. Uh, it's a usual doubler doublet. What we see here is ketene produced in the ethylene flame and acid aldehyde in a dimethyl ethylene flame. Uh, we see uh, still nuclear quadruple coupling or nuclear spin effects. Uh, what we don't see are yet the uh, larger species and also radicals that typically react with the walls of, with our Teflon tube and they're just gone before they, they reach our nozzle. So we want to prove that in the future. What we can see is uh, intensity profiles or concentration profiles in the nozzle when we change the distance between the sampling skimmer and, and the plane of this McKenna burner and we can compare this with the results from mass spectrometry, and, and what we see here is that, that indeed uh, the microwave spectroscopic experiment gives results that uh, are very close to results of the mass spectrometry, so the, as far as the analytical purpose of uh, measuring concentration, concentration profiles is concerned, this, this method works. Plus, we are now sensitive to conformationally different species. So in the future goals is, as I said, to improve our nozzle. Uh, and then we, of course, can misuse the experiment not to do flame spectroscopy for this combustion people, but we can also search in these flames, also using uh, precursors that these flame people normally would not use to produce uh, instable species that, uh, that might then have uh, astrophysical relevance. And then we also actually want to have a time, time of flight mass spectrometer, editor experiment, not to do spectroscopy, but to have uh, 
a, a method of, of beam diagnostics before we look at the, at, at the microwave spectrum, or before we even start looking at the microwave spectrum. And uh, there's a first publication. This is out now in uh, RC, uh, in RC journal. I didn't like to publish in the journal. I don't I even forgot the name of this journal, but it's it's an online journal. Uh, another interesting topic is uh, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which suit if you want to, which you expect in flames, uh, as long as they are not highly symmetric, such that they don't have a dipole moment. Uh, you should also be able to observe them in this flame spectroscopy setup, and the molecules marked in green are those that are already known, a microwave spectrum is published, so it should be possible to detect those, and the other ones, one should first do the spectroscopy of these species to, to do the analytical work. And I'd like to finish my talk thanking uh, people that worked uh, in the uh, developing of the spectrometer. Dennis Waxman did a lot of work in the, in the deep impact setup. Gang Feng and Chan Gu are the, the people at Chongqing University where we built the first IQ modulation type uh, resonator spectrometer. Niels Hansen works at Sandia, so he is a combustion person, and also the people here from, from University of Bielefeld are interested in, in combustion chemistry uh, and, and helped us set up the first demonstration experiment of coupling the flame with a microwave spectrometer. And I thank you for listening. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I never got this point under control. So, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you could follow where I was pointing it. Thank you for the exciting talk. There are questions. I have several. <laughs> so first of all, uh, concerning the extension to the millimeter wave region, uh, what about uh, having uh, the uh, optical propagation of the uh, radiation? So, can you avoid uh, the the cavity? Are you mean instead of well, uh, I, I only showed it for the cavity, but basically, since since the setup is more or less identical, if you want to do a resonator experiment or a chirp experiment, you can just instead of having the resonator with the two mirrors replace them either by horns. Yeah. Then you would have the traditional broadband spectrometer with, which gives you broad lines, but it works just have two horns. You have the, the, the nozzle perpendicular, or you could use these uh, parabolic mirrors, uh, or, you, or you could use a resonator. So basically, the, 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 the electronic setup would be unchanged. You just have to decide if I want to have spherical mirrors, if I want to have parabolic mirrors, or do I just want to have two horns with the, with the supersonic jet shooting across? Uh, basically, you just need, and, and if, if you have horns, you can, of course, use Teflon lenses, whatever, yes. and maybe find other setups how to combine it with a jet, but it, it's, it's really nothing that concerns the spectrometer. The spectrometer always works the same. Okay. And so do you think that you can have the same electronic for uh, um, a, a cavity spectrometer and also for the uh, another spectrometer using horns? And, I mean, you, uh, could even, if you could even have it in the same tank. You could have like a resonator here and then either parabolic reflect antennas or normal horn antennas here. And you maybe, if you, if, you too, if you don't want to change cables all the time, just have microwave switches and switch between this hub and this setup. You can operate them at the same time. The spectrometer electronics would be the same. The only thing is you might want to adapt some of the, the components. For, typically, if you have a resonator, you just don't need a high power amplifier because you have the passive amplification of the resonator to yeah, create sure. high fields. 
So if you if you if you have the horn antennas, you might put in another amplifier to just boost the, the field. So, but the, the electronic in general works the same. That has been done. I mean, you could even use a wave kite to do it. Uh, before all these, these microwave jet type spectrometers uh, started, uh, also Balle Flieger and also, also then later in, in Kiel and also Bauder in Zürich did this wave guide spectrometers. Uh, and Guarneri did Fourier transfer microwave, not much, but in, uh, at some point we tried, I think it worked at 130 gigahertz or something. We did a free transform pulse setup, basically with the same type of electronics, uh, using a multiplier, actually cat whisker, whisker multiplier, and did a, did a free transform spectrometer. The electronic always works. We just combine it with a different sort of antenna. And the uh, another question I have uh, concerning the uh, chemistry in the flames. Uh, have you ever? Mm, uh, thought about uh, um, following the kinetics? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a kinetics person. There are, of course, people that model all this. I mean, this, these flame people, they have their, their spectrometers, but what they mostly do is make models pressure, temperature dependent on what forms. Like, like these astrochemists that have all the model what forms and what pressure, what temperature. So uh, certainly at some point, it's more likely that I'm looking for help doing that than that I'm doing it myself. The goal at the moment is to make the source better, to have the, this long transfer line which we have now reduce mm -hmm. it or, base, or maybe do just without a transfer line really, just sampling into the nozzle in a smarter way with a different geometry of our setup so uh, such that we don't lose all the reactive species that we're losing now. Yeah, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, one of the future goals uh, is uh, uh, to try to uh, observe uh, unknown species of uh, astrochemical uh, uh, importance. And so uh, I think uh, it might also uh, very interesting to understand what happens in the flame when you produce I mean, this. The, the, the point, of course, is because you can change the difference, the distance between the burner and, 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 the, and the skimmer. That also means if it's further away, it's, that's your sample later in yeah. time. Yeah, sure. So then, of course, you c can make a calculation and adjust for, for, the, for the geometry of the setup. But basically, you, you, you're, you're sampling later in time. So you get kinetics. All well, these people get kinetics, too. And then of the, the flame combustion people, they have, a, as far as I understand it, they have a very limited set of, of burning gases. And uh, so they have their models. But if, if you're interested in exotic species in other environments, like for astrophysical purposes, you can put in all kinds of stuff that these people never put in. Yeah, yeah, sure. And if you're not interested in like <laughs> finding the right kinetics, just finding something that's interesting, then there are, there are lots of possibilities. Walter? In the parabolic version of the broadband spectrometer, I'm wondering if you put a second nozzle where, uh, in the point where uh, the radiation comes in, would it improve the signal? Because now you have two mirrors. Uh, I mean, uh, points. One for the detection, one for the... And uh, in the detection, you have the nozzle. Yeah, yeah but, but, but there's your antenna, right? Yeah, but uh, where you detect the signal, you also have the nozzle. No, no, no I have, I have. Uh... Oh. You have a, okay. 
Your nozzle is here, your molecules are here, your de detection is here. Here it is, is both radiation and detection. Yeah, this is, yeah, ex excitation and detection. You have one horn that has excitation and detection, and you have no. your uh, supersonic jet uh, nozzle uh, in the rooftop reflector. And there is no room for another nozzle. No, I mean, this, this, is, this is a rather elaborate structure here. It's very tiny, oh. so you cannot just put a hole in there and put a nozzle in there. I see, yeah. I mean, I, otherwise I would have done it. No, no, this, uh, that's, if you look at these horn antennas, especially this quadrature horn antenna, there's this very, there's no room for that, unfortunately. Yeah, but you have this, you have this, you have these horns, and then inside there are the, these uh, tiny wires that, that feed into the horn structure, and the jet would collide with those. And it kind of goes far in there. It's a very narrow throat. Any further questions? You could, you could, of course, put nozzles in here and here. But, but here you don't have the advantage of focusing the field. So you get very little excitation here because the field strength is not high. Comments? If not, let's thank Jens once again. <laughs>